All right, we'll call to order the regular meeting of the Common Council of the City of Platteville for Tuesday, February 23rd, 2016, and we'll start with roll call. Barbara Stackhausen? Here. Tom Nall? Here. Ken Killian? Here. Eileen Nichols? Here. Amy Seaboth Wilson? Here. Mike Den has been excused, so just be a little bit late. And then Barbara Doss? Here. The first item this evening is a public hearing ordinance. 1603 repeal and recreate chapter 26 floodplain ordinance and we will start with the staff presentation okay um, as mentioned chapter 26 um, regulates development of land within the uh, floodplain areas in, in the city um, this ordinance is based on a model ordinance that has been developed by uh, FEMA and DNR and uh, they do revisions to this ordinance periodically uh, for us to maintain compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program requirements as far as flood insurance and so forth, we also have to adopt uh, the ordinance that is provided to us. Uh, even though it's our ordinance, we regulate it uh, locally, um, but it's really an ordinance that is provided to us by uh, DNR. Um, so if you looked at the ordinance, I included the marked up copy. Um, the only really changes that we made to this ordinance was the numbering system and then the changes that are specific to uh, the city of Platteville which would be the city of Platteville wherever it mentions municipality Grant County and the flood um, map numbers that are specific to the city of Platteville uh, all the other changes to that ordinance were uh, a combination of uh, DNR and uh, FEMA changes um, and they are throughout the document but uh, I guess overall I would say that it, the intent of the program is still the same as what it always has always been in the past as far as the regulation some of the details have changed um, to me the most substantial changes to the ordinance um, would basically give more authority to FEMA as far as reviewing uh, development within floodplain uh, areas if there's any uh, amendments or anything out of the ordinary, they have uh, additional say in it than they've had historically um, in previous years or versions. And then they also have uh, significant more requirements or guidelines as far as how an engineer would provide the modeling to determine what impact the development in the floodplain would have on the floodplain. So they, they uh, provided a lot more detail um, compared to previous versions. Um, so overall, I, like I said, I, I don't think we have a whole lot of say in it. We can be more restrictive than what is provided, but we can't be less restrictive. Um, I don't have any suggested changes as far as being more restrictive. Um, and since it is a, a, a program that we have to maintain compliance with for property owners to obtain flood insurance, um, I would definitely recommend approval uh, of the ordinance so we maintain that compliance. So. Um, the plan commission reviewed it and recommended approval and staff would also recommend approval any questions Are there any changes in the elevations as far as floodway? Um, well the an effect upon buildings for example, we have I know one building that part of the building Met it underneath the old elevation the new part does not they had um, we, we had actually already adopted the updated floodplain maps for Platteville uh, a month or two ago. Um, but my understanding with those maps, they did not do any updated um, engineering studies to go with those. They're basically improved maps as far as the graphics and the, the base mapping. Um, so there really aren't any changes that would impact specific structures. Um, I know some of the properties that are in the floodplain, specifically down on Business Highway, Highway 151, have done a uh, letter of map amendments where they've hired an engineer to do a study of their particular property that has modified whether they are in the district or in the floodplain or not. But those are not reflected in the actual maps, so there's a separate document that uh, applies to that individual property. So nothing that we would be approving tonight or would have a direct impact on any particular property any other questions well uh, since the chamber is here tonight i have a question that's out of curiosity in in 1969 the water came over the road in 151 in front of the pizza hut so in looking at the elevation for the chamber office are you 
below that level or at or maybe you don't I was just curious. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, the public hearing format is I ask for public statements in favor. We've had no one register to speak. Public statements against, again, no one registered. Our public statements in general. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? I'll move. Second. We have a motion and a second and we'll vote. Stackhausen? Yes. Nall? Here. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. See both Wilson? Yes. Doss? Yes. Motion carries. Any further council discussion? If not, a motion would be in order. I move to adopt the revised uh, floodplain ordinance. Second. We have a motion and a second. No we'll vote. Stackhausen? Yes. Nall? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. See both Wilson? Yes. Doss? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is a presentation of the annual tourism report. <coughs> Good evening. I'm Kathy Kopp with the Platteville Regional Chamber, and I'm here officially to present the tourism report for 2015 we are required by state law to provide the um, the city with a a report and while it's would be sufficient to turn it in I always like to to come and and make a short presentation uh, we only killed one small tree for this report this year so uh, what I wanted, what's in your packet on the left side, we, we made available copies of the print ads that we did for the year. So most of that is just for your information. And then the sheet that's on the left side is the action plan for 2015 that we followed. And that is in a format that was approved several years ago and the one for 2016 is also in here, but the middle section is actually our report. And um, uh, the lodging properties um, produce, a, it's over a $2 million industry here. We do have a 5% room tax. As a tourism entity, we receive 70%. So this report covers the 70% that we do get. Um, and there are categories where we allocate the funds. Um, the, the travel center, wel the welcome center is a significant portion of that. I would like to note that we had almost 10,000 visitors this year handled over 9,500 emails and um, distributed about 32,000 brochures. So we were very, very busy. The second section is about the destination marketing, which I just explained is the, the print ads, the radio ads, um, the, any of the direct marketing that we do so that it's um, all covered in there. We also, um, pay a significant amount of attention to the website. It's the new website is very interactive and prove, is proven to be um, very much um, approved by the public that, that are looking for information, especially the visitors. We do a lot of work with calendar of events, um, posting our events to any number of other websites. And, and keeping up on that, um, not just for our events, but for community events, wherever possible. Um, on section five is about public relations, and that has anything to do with meetings, attending conferences, um, writing press releases, um, uh, working with other groups, which is, is uh, significant as well. 
And with the uh, partnership that we have with the Wisconsin Department of Tourism of specific note, in 2015 we were, we were honored to actually have hosted one of the Department of Tourism's Governor's Council meetings. Uh, they hold one of our, they hold monthly meetings and one time a year they go out of Madison. So in June of 2015, they did come to Platteville and we were able to give them a tour, took them to the museum, took them to, um, they got to climb the M and visited the first um, territorial capital. And then they had their, their meeting here in town. We work with Tri-State Tourism, um, promote the Great River Road. We also provide conference services. If there are large groups coming to town, we put packets together. Um, we were very busy with that um, in 2015, um, specifically with the university. And then another section that we do is events and projects. So that section outlines the historic reenactment, Dairy Days, Hometown Festival, Driftless Summer Ride, a new event called Derby Days that was held in May of last year. And obviously um, we work very closely with the Mining and Ronald Jamison Museum. And then the last part of our budget is contract administration. Um, so those, those are the details, but I also want to report that the Department of Tourism does a very in-depth study of economic impact, and the latest numbers we have are from 2014, and they do it by county. In 2014, Grant County saw a 2.6% a increase, and the Department of Tourism has indicated us some time ago that because of our size, the number of lodging properties we have, the number of restaurants and retail um, outlets, that the community of Platteville can easily claim 50, at least 50% of that economic impact. And in 2014, um, that was over $42 million. So for the community of Platteville, that meant uh, economic impact of well over $21 million. And a bright side note is that with the partnership that we have with the city, the city retains 28%. In 2015, we had a 1% increase in the room tax from four to 5%. Um, the tourism entity uh, working closely with the Chamber's Tourism Council and the city's tourism committee um, went to great lengths working on how we were going to deal with that. And uh, early in the year, we did not budget for the additional 1%. Um, we spent a lot of time putting a wish list together of what we wanted to do with the additional money come the end of the year. Well, there, there were monies that were, that were left unspent, and that financial report I'll uh, talk to you about in just a second. But what we're going to do with that money is we've made arrangements and signed a contract with the Department of Transportation. We are finally going to get one of the really large tourist information signs on 151 at exit 18. When we became a welcome center in 2009, the price tag for that, the, that signage was over $20,000. So um, we felt that that would be a very appropriate place to put additional monies. It's a one-time expense, and then after they're installed, um, the DOT takes over all maintenance. But they are eight foot by 16 feet wide. They're mounted on concrete piers, and there is going to be signage both, both northbound and southbound on exit 18. And the significance of that is that unless you're coming, if you're coming into the state and you're not familiar with Southwest Wisconsin, you don't see Platteville until you get to the east side. So by having exit 18 signed, we feel that it's going to be bringing a lot more people into the community. So uh, we're really excited about that, but the really good news about that sign is that the price has gone from 20,000 to 10,500. 
So um, the contract's been signed and DOT is working on getting us a time frame of when that sign's gonna be installed. And I asked them if we could pretty please get it before the 1st of May so that we'd be up and ready, ready and going by the time our uh, busy tourism season starts. In on the back flap of your um, binder there, is a one-page um, uh, financial statement that shows that if you go through it, we followed the, the budget, but what is left over is nearly $5,000. And we just want to make, make it uh, very clear that that money is going to be rolled over into the 2016 budget and those are the additional dollars that are going to be used towards the purchase of that sign. And then because we received fourth quarter room tax in earlier this month, um, that's already, um, according to our budget, or for our idea of the budget for 2016, we're already up by $5,000. So we anticipate a really good year, but um, there's a lot of considerations. And then be also on the right side is the 2016 report that follows the same, the same outline um, as, as we have in the past. The same categories. Um, the, the narrative is a little different, obviously, as would be expected. But what is, um, I think, going to explain things the most is the very last page, page six. It, there's some blue ink on there. Notice it's blue and not red. Um, what it is is the tourism budget for, for 2016. Anything in blue highlights uh, what those numbers look like in 2015. So in tw when we, we really operated on a 4% room tax and um, to be conservative, not knowing exactly how the, the increase was going to work. So by having that 1% increase, um, the percentages um, are significant because the percentages look a lot different. For example, 20, the visitor center last year, it took 44% of the budget uh, I'm sorry, this year, in 2016, it's 44% versus last year of 59%. Destination marketing, um, and that's the direct advertising, is now 26% 20 per of the budget compared to 11% last year. And on down through, you can see that, that um, by having the 1% increase, it's really allocating much more uh, money to destination marketing, marketing, which is that second item. So our budget for last year was $6,274. In 2016, that amount is 20533 So the increase will be applied, obviously, in 2016 but it's gonna make the program uh, run a lot better. Um, we were very thankful um, for the 1% increase that happened in the fall of 2014. We felt that we had a, an, an exceptionally good year and overall, um, the, uh, through the efforts with the partnership of the, the city and um, the chamber as a tourism entity, the, we were able to generate a revenue stream for the city in last year that totaled more than $34,000. So does anybody have any questions? Like I said, there's so much information in here, um, but we attend the, um, the meetings for the, the city's tourism committee and um, updates are given constantly. So this is kind of a lot once a year to, <laughs> to present to you all, but um, we try to give you a good overview um, of how the year went and what we're looking forward to this year. Now in 2016, 
I do want to let you know too that the budget has um, increased to allow us to do more with events and projects, which is something that we'd heard from the council a few years ago that they would like more, more emphasis on. So in 2016, we're rolling out three new projects, or events really. Um, June 18th, which is Saturday of Father's Day weekend, uh, please stay in town, bring your families and your friends because we are going to host an ag tourism event um, at Bob Digman's farm. It's going to be a day-long event. It's going to be free to the public, and it's going to be ag tourism at its best, and it's called A Day on the Farm. So we're working with the Milk Marketing Board, the Wisconsin Ag Tourism Association, uh, local FFA, the 4-H clubs, and there's going to be vendors, there's going to be local foods, uh, all kinds of demonstrations and educational opportunities, and again, all kinds of acti activities that are family, family friendly and absolutely free. And then another ag tourism event is on Saturday, September 24th, when we're going to host our first fall harvest table dinner. Uh, again, at the Bob Digman Farm, that will be a ticketed event, but we're really excited about that because we're working with Southwest Tech's Culinary School and Ed White's Commercial Kitchen at the Incubator, and um, the students from Southwest Tech are going to pre be preparing um, a full course dinner using as close to 100% local foods as we can make it. So uh, we're really excited about that. We've got a lot of partners that are working on both those events with us. And then on July 30th, um, we've already talked about this some, but we are rolling out our first Southwest Music Festival that will be held in the downtown. And right now, we have a, at least 12 different live music venues uh, throughout downtown. So it's going to be a fantastic day and we are conservatively expecting 2,000 people. Keeping in mind that, the, un that the, the university students for the most part are not here. So that's 2,000 new people. And it's going to be combined with a craft fair in City Park um, working with the Platteville Farmers Market, and it should be a really good day. And with that, we are hosting a, an information meeting next Tuesday night, March 1st, at Mount City Bank um, at 6 o'clock. And we'd love to have everybody come because there are so many components to the music festival that we just want to make sure that the community is well aware of what we're doing and how they can participate and take advantage of all of those visitors that are going to be coming to town. Does anybody have any questions? I know it's a lot to ab absorb. and. As you get chance to read through it, if you've got any questions, please, my business card is in there. You can give me a call. Tom, did you have a yeah. question? Uh, your destination marketing, does yes. that include the sign? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But again, the sign is a um, one-time expense. Okay. Any other questions, anyone? All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next is the consideration of the consent calendar. The following items may be approved on a single motion or vote due to their routine nature of previous discussion. Please indicate to the council president if you would prefer separate discussion and action. Council minutes, and I know that Councilor Killian has uh, one comment he would like to make on that, so I'll let him do that after I go through the rest of this. Uh, B is payment of bills. C is appointments to boards and commissions. Have none this evening, but we're still looking for people for the Board of Appeals and also the Commission on Aging. So if you're interested in serving on a board or commission or committee for the city, please go to our webpage, platwell.org, and you can find the information there. Licenses in the, listed in the packet, one year and two year operator license to sell or serve alcohol. And permits, a street closing permit to UW Platteville for 43016 for the third annual Wisconsin Energy Efficient Vehicle Association competition. That's a long title, but that sounds like a lot of fun. And the second one is uh, 5116 for a Hunter Hayes concert. 
Okay, I would like to see one change, one word change in the minutes, and that's under uh, action B. I believe it's the fifth line, and it states there, added to the lease that would require the sale, and that was not my intent as far as the paragraph that I made up and gave to Luke. I could not be here at the last meeting, but I like that word require change to promote. The idea was promotion was not requirement. So that's the one word change. Would you like to make a motion with that change? I move that we uh, approve the consent calendar with the one word change as indicated. Second. We have a motion and a second. We'll vote. Stackhausen? Yes. Nall? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Seabolt Wilson? Yes. Doss? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is citizens' comments, observations, and petitions, and we have one person who's asked to speak, Mr. Christensen. And again, I would ask that you limit yourself to five minutes, but please come up to the microphone. Okay. Hello, I'm Rich Christensen, and I live at 10 South 3rd Street here in Platteville. I'm here to ask some questions about Platteville public transportation, not so much about the taxi service. I'm really here to comment and ask questions about bus service. I've given the Common Council just two pages of information, and I will read just parts of those two pages now. Perhaps the Common Council would like to discuss or ask questions today but I would suggest they look at the numbers, take the information, look at the numbers, and then do their own calculations. Hopefully the Common Council will look at the information, get more information, <coughs> and then do something. Okay. Based on the numbers in the Platteville Transit year-end report, has the agreement with the university cost taxpayers $64.23 per bus ride? In 2014, before she acknowledged her conflict of interest, Amy Seaboth Wilson said, quote, this would only work if it served both the city and the university. So does $64.23 per bus ride serve the city? Two weeks ago, at the last Common Council meeting, Howard Crowfoot pre presented his Platteville Transit year-end report. The Common Council asked very few questions. I would like to ask some question now, questions now. This is the fourth year of bus service in Platteville. Where are the numbers? There are 10 years of numbers for taxi service in the year-end report, but nothing for the first three years of bus service. Now that public money is paying for the majority of bus service and the total cost of bus, bus service has doubled, shouldn't some numeric comparisons be made? Shouldn't some cost analysis be done? The year-end report shows that 1,759 bus rides produced $1,159 in bus fares. Is 1,759 an accurate number? The number of bus rides exceeding bus fare dollars by 52% does not seem right. The year-end report shows that 13 monthly bus passes were sold over seven months. Did just two people buy bus passes? I will only ask about two of the questionable conclusions that were listed in the year-end report. Conclusion number five states that fall 2016 is when the city should determine if it will extend contracts. In the fall, will the Common Council be surprised to learn that the city cannot end the contracts? Someone must know that the intergovernmental agreement requires six months written notice to make changes. Conclusion number three is, shall we say, interesting. In January 2015, when the Common Council approved the intergovernmental agreement and the bus service contract, all nine of Howard Crowfoot's budgets used 58.0% in estimating the federal state subsidy. It didn't matter if it was taxi only, bus only, or taxi bus combined. Every budget used 58.0%. Now, in the year-end report, the taxi statistics 
use an estimated subsidy of 51.6% rather than 58.0%, and surprise, a deficit. The bus statistics use an estimated subsidy of 70.9% rather than 58.0%, and surprise, a surplus. Are the numbers in the year-end report accurate? Were the numbers presented to the Common Council in January of 2015 not accurate? In three months, at the end of the sp spring semester in May, the end of the one-year trial period will be reached. And by that time, probably a quarter of a million public dollars will have been wasted. If the Common Council does not end the intergovernmental agreement in May, then more public money will be wasted. There are quite a few things concerning the year-end report that the Common Council should discuss. Can the Common Council answer this one question? How many additional bus rides were provided and at what additional cost? Thank you. Thank you. We have another person who's asked to speak, Ila Kakti, for informational purposes only. Good evening to the council. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, this is very timely, and I appreciate the re reports and the statistics that were compiled concerning the transportation plan. Ela, could you give your name and your address? Please? Sure. Ela Cockaday, 170 Ridge Avenue here in Platteville. Thank you. Um, should I continue? Yeah. Great. Um, I also represent, uh, um, I work with area businesses in Platteville. And one of the issues that we tackle quite a bit is uh, underemployment, trying to tackle workforce issues. And one of the key components of that is providing access to public transportation and childcare. And I really want to offer kudos to Platteville for putting together public transportation because right now it's getting the word out there and getting people involved to understand that this service is available. We have a lot of our area businesses use the public transportation and some of our businesses are actually expanding. Um, we have one in particular that I've been allowed to use their name, American Customer Care. They're looking for 40 new employees and the bus route is actually on, on in front of their location. And so about 10% of their staff use the public transportation and they do the use the shared ride taxi. So I just want to put that out for there for public um, information that this is a growing use and I think it helps uh, Platteville address a critical need when it comes to getting people from home to work. Thank you. Thank you. Those are the only public comments we have. Um, next are reports. Our city manager did ask to, uh, to speak on something this evening, so I'll start with her before I go through the other reports. Uh, good evening, council members. Uh, one of the items that came up is really in relation to a meeting that the a community meeting the university is going to be holding uh, here in our council chambers tomorrow night. And I know that a couple of council members had mentioned to me that they thought it would be nice if that meeting were televised. Uh, the university did approach us about televising the meeting. Uh, when I went to refer to our policy with respect to televising, um, it's a fairly dated policy um, that, that dates back to uh, around 2000. And it references that if outside groups are going to be uh, using uh, the, the equipment in our, uh, our facility here, that they have to provide their own staff. The reality is today that we can't allow that. We have to have our own staff actually work the equipment if we're going to televise. And so uh, my question to you is, would, uh, are you interested in having our staff provide that service so that that meeting is able to be televised? Feelings of the council? For my part, it's fine. Yes, I expected it to be televised. Sure. I think it would be a good thing. All right, okay. thank you. Uh, other reports in the packet? Platteville Community Safe Routes Committee, Seabolt Wilson. Nothing to add. Land Commission, Nichols or Ben? Nothing. Uh, Library Board, I have nothing to add. Water and Sewer Commission, no Killian or Stockhausen? No addition. None. Parks, Forestry and Recreation Committee, Seabolt Wilson? Nothing to add. 
On to the action item, which is resolution <coughs> 1603, approving a conditional use permit to operate an asphalt plant. Okay, this is the uh, annual request we received from Iverson Construction. They have the uh, asphalt plant in the, uh, uh, the rock quarry off Mineral Street. Um, there are no changes proposed uh, to that operation uh, from previous years. Um, we, we had the only change, the only uh, issue that's come up since I've been here is several years ago with uh, dust uh, coming from the roadway as the trucks enter and leave. So they, they did um, uh, pave part of that driveway and then they've done some dust control as needed um, um, in addition to that. Um, and that seems to have taken care of the problem. So um, staff would recommend approval with the conditions that we've had from previous years that it expire at the end of the asphalt producing season. It's subject to this property only and the applicant provides dust control as needed. Uh, the plant commission considered this at their February meeting and also recommended approval with those conditions. Any questions? <coughs> questions, anyone? All right, is there a motion? I move approval to allow the asphalt plant to operate for the upcoming season in the May in. As it has in previous years. I have a motion and a second. I will vote. Stackhausen? Yes. Nall? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Seaboth Wilson? Yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Motion carries. The first information and discussion item is creating a handicapped parking stall on the east side of South Elm Street. Yes, um, as part of the library block development, the contractor blocked off access to the library's parking lot, uh, and the lot had a designated handicapped parking stall for the library. Uh, staff has designated a temporary handicapped parking stall on the east side of Elm Street. Uh, just south of the uh, handicapped access from the street up to the building. Um, and staff is recommending that the council approve an ordinance uh, designating the stall for the duration of the library block redevelopment project. And uh, if, if you so approve, then when weather permits, we'll uh, put a permanent sign in the ground and paint it on the curb or on the uh, on the uh, roadway. Any questions? Okay, on to the next information discussion item, creating a five minute parking space on Mineral Street by City Hall. The uh, Southwest Cap Clinic will be moving in to the old police department area on the northeast corner of City Hall. Um, there is a parking stall on Mineral Street in front of the glass doors that would be used as the public entrance for the clinic. Um, clinic staff is requesting the space be designated for limited parking. Um, uh, for those coming for regular appointments, they'll need to find a space in one of our public lots or on the street, but uh, uh, we would agree that uh, for deliveries and uh, folks who need a prescription or other tasks, Either a loaded or either a loading zone or a limited parking time would be best, um, based on everything that that we're looking at. Um, we're we're looking we're recommending that uh, we designate it as a five-minute parking stall. Um, this will provide rapid turnover of vehicles desired. Um, it can also be used by uh, patrons of City Hall or any of the other businesses in the area if, uh, if they so desire. Um, it cannot be designated specifically for clinic use. Um, so that's what we're asking is that it be designated as a five minute parking stall, similar to what's out on Bonson Street. Questions, anyone? Just one quick question, Howard. Is this a temporary thing while they're working on Bonson Street, or is this going to be a permanent thing? We're recommending that that this be uh, at least for the duration of the library block project uh, until the clinic moves uh, to their new location, their permanent location. Okay, thank you. Will this just be daytime hours or evening, too? <coughs> it would it would be just five minute parking. Um, okay. Thank you. 
All right, next item is the city attorney contract, which is in the packet. If anybody has any questions? Well, um, I have a number of questions. Um, for the uh, previous council meeting, I asked for the uh, job description for the city manager and the um, director of administration and also the finance director, uh, different name for that position now. And so I have a number of questions. And today, um, uh, the city manager and I talked about uh, our getting our meeting and discussing my questions so that uh, these may come back as possible changes. They may not. So that's instead of taking the time that the council here to ask all the questions that I have and, and try to get answers, I prefer to meet with the city manager. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments? All right. Next is the adoption of the protective covenants for the new portion of the industry park. This is Ela Cockade calling from um, PADIC, Platteville Area Industrial Development Corporation. And PADIC is recommending that we adopt the covenants for the newest portion of the industry park. These covenants are essentially the landscape and the guidelines associated with the physical development as industries start locating in the park. And this, uh, this was brought forth by a regular discussion from the Covenant Committee of PADIC, and that is comprised of our illustrious city manager, or city, uh, city uh, planner, Joe Carroll, uh, Tom Geyer, who is counsel for PADIC, uh, Dan Dressens, who is involved with the site and design for the new portion of the industry park, uh, myself, Steve Lopes, um, who is uh, industry park resident, and Ed White, who is our point person for EDA funds. So after discussion, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, this is, this is just jarring. Um, after that discussion, uh, we made a series of changes to um, the covenants, and these from the original covenants, and those changes essentially were that the site needed to be, um, improvements seemed to be above 250,000 per acre versus 125, as we would like to see more improvements come to our land so um, it reflects the infrastructure, the kind of businesses that we want to engage in the park. Um, also, we were looking at no sale of industry park land would be to tax exempt entities without any prior written approval with the city of Platteville. Um, excess soil to be removed or expanded to include other city property. And then considering the location that the exclusion of um, the visibility wouldn't be applied to 151 in terms of uh, what type of uh, coverings would be used. Um, the visual component from 155, 151 is quite difficult to see from East Side Road. So, um, and then lastly, the wording around solid versus opaque fencing. So those are um, comprising most of the changes to the covenants, and essentially, we'd like to move forward with adopting the covenants because we have businesses that are interested in locating to the industry park, and we would like to use this as a guideline so they can move forward with making their business plans. As they move forward with what their site design and business plan looks like, um, they come to the covenant committee, we have used this as a guideline, and then they can um, design it appropriately in conjunction with the city's desires. I have a question for you, Ellen. Um, when I look through this, do you also have a noise uh, ordinance with that? So let me ask you a question. This is an industrial park, right? Not a silent zone. So what do you actually have in reference to the noise? In reference uh, to the noise, I am not familiar with that particular portion. But typically, let's say if you're looking at a motorcycle, a motorcycle moving is about 80 decibels. Now, that's passing through. Now, typically, the type of uh, noises that you hear in an industrial park are about 40, 40 decibels. That's about sim similar to your shower your shower coming down upon you. So in terms of the noise level, that's uh, pretty comparable. What kind of industry are you talking about versus what I might be talking about, OK? Industry has more noise than 40 decibels, OK? Maybe some of the stuff that you see around here. I'm saying this because I'm an old John Deere employee. And I know what our decibels level were in all different areas, OK? If you really want an in industry out here, I think that you're going to have to reconsider that a little bit. I really do. And are you talking about in the interior versus the exterior? Exterior, that's what you're talking about. Correct. And so when you're talking about uh, the decibel level for your experience, was that with the interior or with the exterior? No, no, that, 
We did both. We okay. actually did decibel testing throughout the factory to maintain certain standards because OSHA also has standards, okay? But anyway, outside, okay, when we had a foundry, you think that would be 40 decibels? Obviously not. I don't see us having a foundry here, but I think that that might be a problem when you start when, hopefully we're gonna look at real industry in our industrial park. There's a lot of stuff out there that's not really considered what you would see in an industrial park, per se, okay? So I'm thinking I don't want us to close the doors on something that it might actually bring some big paying jobs and a lot of them. I and mean, we're always trying to do this. Ela, there was no change in the noise portion of this. Is correct. That correct. And Joe, could you tell us when these uh, original um, uh, covenants, covenants were adopted? 2000, right? Um, the, the original ones were predate me. That's what um, I thought. They were about 1986. Okay. They were, were revised. Um, actually, I, I revised, worked on revisions um, in the early, probably about 2001, 2002. And were there revisions the in the noise the portion at that point? No, we just kind of carried what was in the original forward. So this is really carried a forward from 1986 or 87 right. or 88. Right. Uh, I don't want anybody to think that it says 40 decibels. There's uh, frequencies within a chart and then different decibel levels for different frequencies within the chart. There's also a timing issue, whether it's during the day or whether it's during the night. Um, Joe, during the time that you've been involved with this, has any industry, has this precluded anybody from considering our industrial park? Has anybody raised any concerns about this? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Brian, you've been involved somewhat too as developers agreements and stuff. Have any potential discussions ever raised any issues with the noise portion <coughs> of these covenants? Not that I've been involved in. I think okay. they must be pretty standard. <laughs> for. And it might be. Parts. I just thought it was a question that we should at least address while we're looking at new parts of the, of the uh, industrial park. And just to reiterate, th that's a great question. And this is a conversation. This is a conversation not just here at council, but a conversation with the business that the covenant committee actually engages in. We're providing guidelines in order to begin this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. How, how is it tested? In, ter in terms of, um, <clears throat> in other words, how do we make sure that they're not going over the decibel amount? Okay, well, I should just um, preface this by, I was giving the example of decibels just based on industry standards, but um, usually the type of business that is gonna be coming in, what their land needs are in terms of, you know, how much land, kind of improvements that they're gonna be providing, that starts, that starts the conversation. And then from there, the Covenant Committee acts as um, the point guard in asking those kinds of questions. Okay. And, and Tom, the document references, frequencies and sound levels shall be measured with an octave band analyzer and sound level meter, which comply with the USA standards prescribed by the United States of America Standards Institute. So it appears that we have some I was kind just of, wondering yeah. who does it, not so much how it's. Yeah. That's my main concern is how can you regulate it if you don't have somebody appointed to make sure that it is being that it's maintaining its uh, <coughs> level that it's supposed to be in. Okay, well, um, that begs a fair question, and I'm sure we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I will say that back in the day, I used to do part 150 noise studies for airport expansion, so I am familiar with using the equipment, so. Any other questions? Just I have a question about the Covenant Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, it says there's five members. Um, how long a term do these members serve? It's called together as needed basis. So typically, um, the Covenants Committee has been made up of a member from city staff, and it's located, it's um, defined in the bylaws um, in terms of who would be part of the Covenant Committee. So it's comprised of the existing board members and then necessary city staff. So it's a standing committee, and the members change? Members do change. And they don't have a, you don't list a term here for length of service. Mm. How long do they serve on the committee? 
that begs the question. We can revisit that in our bylaws. But currently, um, it's based on the the people that are engaged in the property, the real estate side of development of the industry park. So Ed White, our city planner, um, our uh, Dan Dressens, who was involved in the site design. So at that time, it made sense to have those people involved. And then my next question is, is there a lead person as far as on the committee to get the com committee together? That would be How me. Does that function? So I get the people together, the committee together, and luckily in the past, uh, Joe Carroll has been um, sort of our institutional memory in keeping the covenants in track, making those changes, and then forwarding them on to council. And I bring that in front of the PADIC committee, or the PADIC board, and the board makes a recommendation, and then it is brought forward to the city council for approval. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more question for you. When you're talking about change, because of the, the cost of the land when we purchased it, so that's going to change our base value. We have, what, 17500 per acre is what we had before, I believe. Um, are we talking about the land price formula, which is the s right. next component? I can wait. You're talking about that next. So. Sure, that's fine. Any other questions on this particular item first, on the uh, pro uh, protective covenants? All right, seeing none, then we're going to go on to the adjustment of the land price formula for the 39-acre Pribal Industry Park Edition. Great. So with the land price formula, um, I think you have a copy of the staff report, and then also you have a narrative in front of you. So instead of doing a PowerPoint, I wanted just to walk through the narrative, which is the explanation behind the changes to our land price formula. So, so that is actually included in the packet. It's about two pages in, I think, is what you're... Yep. Talking about yeah, I was just wrote. looking at the front page here when we were talking about the changes. The baseline was 17.5, and now it's going to be 27.5. Right, and that we'll talk about that. Okay. Okay. The baseline actually will be 67,500. So there's a there's a about 3.8 increase in that price. Now, if you look at um, this is what the reason that it is prompting this change is that this new portion of the industry park is funded partly by EDA monies. So we got roughly a 50% matching uh, grant in order to cover our industry park expansion. Per the requirements of the EDA, they're asking that our, fair, our uh, land price be reflective of fair market value. Fair market value would be the cost of the land, the land tra transaction was 27,500, plus the cost of improvements, which roughly is about $40,000 per acre. You add that up, it's 67500 And so that's roughly about a 3.8 um, times the original amount of 17500 And so as a result, we've made the adjustments to the land price formula because in this business, we, um, comparably speaking, other parts of Wisconsin, um, our neighbors, are working to give away land at a dollar. It is a discussion of the right kind of business coming into Platteville in order to maximize our tax base, provide good paying jobs. That's what the land price formula is um, predicated on. So as a result, we made changes to the formula based on this 3.8% increase. And what we did was that we asked that improvements, instead of being um, 100 and, uh, at $150,000, Dollars, and then we start giving um, incentives, that we look that there's a threshold of about $250,000 per acre um, improvement. So a building, um, so the building should have at roughly about $250,000 of impl improvements per acre. So depending on the number of acres consumed, that goes up based on the kind of building that is being asked to be put forward. That way, they're not asking for more land that they need. Um, and that we are providing land with infrastructure without recouping it through our tax base. Does that make sense? I understand. Okay. My, my whole point is I have a real problem with what we had before. Because when we had that, it was based on what a real, real old land value, okay? And I really don't like to see us giving land away at a dollar and a quarter an acre, okay? So when I looked at this, you're changing the incentives values for the different paid jobs. Mm -hmm. Why do we need to give them more money? Let's give them, they don't have to have any more money. It's going to increase what they have to pay, okay? And I'd rather see us doing that, and I know everybody else here is going to go, Mike, we need to get people into the industrial park. We have to compete. 
but I think our land-based prices were kind of ridiculous. I really did. When the, the industrial park was established many, many, many years ago, when they first purchased that land, it was set up at a certain price per acre because that would recoup our cost as a city to bring that all back. Obviously, since we've changed with the land formulas that we use and the way we do business today, that doesn't ever happen. So we're always in a negative when it comes to giving land, okay? Look at what it cost us, what the infrastructure was, 40000 you said, an acre, okay? Uh, if we sell 10 acres at $2.50 an acre for somebody, obviously we're not going to recoup any of our money, and we never have, okay? So... so um, Go ahead. Go okay, ahead. so the discussion, the rhetoric behind how we're going to structure our land price formula are, is to, based on two things. If we are giving away a lot of land, then we want to be able to um, ha make sure that that building that's coming in is large enough to, in other words, pay the bills so that we are getting the land, uh, the, the price recouped back in property tax base. And so we ran a multiple number of scenarios based on the city tax rate and then used using um, examples between low, medium, high scenarios of the type of building that would be put in for, say, a manufacturing or a warehouse, different types of uh, examples that way, then we would be recouping our tax base in the span of between 10 to 12 years, depending on the scenario that we're using. So. It depends on the kind of business and what kind of business we want to incentivize. So if we're incentivizing um, a, big improvements, a ma manufacturing firm that's coming in that's going to be putting in a $1.6 million building, then we're going to be starting to recoup our, um, our money back through tax base. Conversely, if we get a small firm that only wants to use, say, maybe one acre or two acres in the industrial park, but they're a tech firm and they want to bring in high paying jobs. Well, now the land is no longer the incentive, but the jobs are incentive. We get those high paying jobs into the community and those high paying jobs, that means that people are spending money in our community, they're going to our restaurants, so there's a direct effect of the the taxes that are used from people buying houses, spending money, but then also the indirect and induced effects of people using that money and supporting um, other services like childcare, like gas stations, et cetera. And so you start having a ripple effect, a flowing effect. And that is why um, we offer these kinds of incentives. It's because we want to make sure that we retain these kinds of jobs and this kind of circulating do dollar within our community. I understand that, and that is, it's a great scenario, and that's what we we'll really hope for. But when you look at with all the what we've done in the industrial park in the last say well, eight or ten years, and then you look at what our tax-paying individuals, tax base, number of people in the city, it it hasn't been a big difference. That hasn't happened to us yet. Okay, so when I'm talking about people that actually pay taxes that live in the city limits of Platteville, not the surrounding area. Okay. I'm hoping that this will happen, but that's, like I said, the scenario, is, I understand it, and it's great if that does happen. It hasn't happened in the past for us, so hopefully it will in the future. Well, I would like to just reinforce that this discussion was um, presented twice with the PADIC board. We ran a multiple number of scenarios, and this is a standard that is used um, throughout, throughout uh, many states in the U.S. And lastly, in order to address the discussion about tax base, we're going to be engaging in a work session, and um, Mr. Killian had asked a series of questions to that same effect. And so we're going to go start going through those numbers and maybe break that out a little bit more and maybe address some of those questions that you have. Because I'm confident that based on the amount of tax base that is constantly being returned to the community, that our, our businesses are returning that based on our jobs and based on the improvements that they're putting into. So. Um, I'll have to respectfully um, be able to provide you with more information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions, or either, did you want to include or give us any more information on this? Or well, I would like um, this is the information stage, so I would like you to take your time, peruse that. If you have any questions, please contact me and discuss with the paydic staff through city manager, our city manager, and um, you know, please let's have that rich discussion. And uh, if we'd like to move forward with this because we do have uh, quite a bit of interest in the industry park. So we need to have those covenants and the land price formula approved so we can start um, running those calculations so we can offer businesses, hey, let's offer you some parcels. Let's get you into here at Platteville. I have a question about benefits. You, on your 
cover page here. Uh, what benefits are you uh, calling benefits? Health and pension, and what beyond those two? Anything? Uh, that could be retirement, that could be uh, vision dental, that could be um, uh, matching employment retiree retirement. It's a whole range. Do you do any rating of the benefits for a particular company that might be interested? We do not. That is not within our purview. However, roughly benefits are about an um, additional 40%. Uh, so that's what we bundle into um, the wage. And then if there are benefits that are available, then we add that on top in terms of determining the price. Do any of the uh, benefits include, for example, family leave? That's a good question. It may with some. It may with some. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I might. Yeah. I might just uh, make a, a couple of follow-up comments to the uh, questions that uh, Council Member Dan had. I think one of the reasons why the land price formula is weighted more heavily towards um, the physical improvements to the property is because that that then generates the tax base that then reimburses the land subsidy over time. And the, the second comment I would make is that um, I'm, I'm new to Wisconsin. I came from an area where we did very little in terms of incentivizing uh, business. Um, but I have had a chance to work with ELA and to actually meet with a few uh, prospective uh, businesses. And I can tell you that we don't have a lot of tools in our toolbox compared with, um, we don't have as many tools in our toolbox as compared with some of our neighboring states. And so I do think that this land price formula is a very important tool that we do have uh, to assist us in recruiting businesses. All right, thank you. The next item on information is former Pioneer Ford Properties, the RFP Review Committee. Um, when the council had previously discussed uh, this property and the outcomes after we get it cleaned up and so forth, um, there was a little bit of a discussion about having a, a committee set up to review the proposals as they come in and, and then make a recommendation to the council. So we are just following through with that idea um, so we have a little bit of time yet. The proposals aren't due until April 8th, but, um, you know, the council needs to provide some direction as far as who those individuals would be. And uh, we, we had, I guess, just kind of thrown out a suggestion as two council members, two staff members, and a member of the RDA. If you've got other suggestions or ideas as far as the makeup of that committee, you know, that's your choice. Obviously, you're setting up this committee, but we just would not want it to be too large of a group so it's it's workable um, so we'd say a maximum of seven members but five seemed like a, a good number when we were having the discussion um, but anyway just to get it in front of you to give some thought to um, who that membership or who those members should be and how it should be composed and so forth so that we have it in place when we start receiving the actual proposals all right, so if you have ideas, please let me know if you would like to uh, include a different population or, or person or um, organization. Otherwise, right now we're looking at two council people, so also consider whether or not you would be interested in serving. And would this basically be one meeting, Joe, two meetings? Do you have any idea? I, I don't know at this point. I guess it depends on how many proposals we get in and how, how detailed the information is. Um, I'm thinking it could be a couple of meetings. And sometime after April 8th. Right. Okay. And the, the potential developer would be brought in. Are we going to screen first and then decide I, whether anybody... Right. That I would say we would look in. at the documents that we receive first, and then if he needed additional information, if he wanted to do interviews or something like that, that would be up to the committee to decide how they'd like to proceed. Okay. Next item, Community Safe Routes Committee, the Community Involvement for Future Bike Lanes. Yes. Um, Safe Routes Committee uh, has been approached about 
uh, possibly installing bike lanes on some of the uh, streets in town. After the discussion, the group decided to focus on Ridge Avenue uh, because children use the street to get to and from middle school, high school, the pool and parks. One of the concerns is that in the morning, sunrise uh, blinds drivers who are traveling east when the children are also riding on the street. Um, they would like to evaluate community response to the idea of painting a bike lane on both sides of the street to give bicyclists and drivers an indicator of where each is supposed to be. Um, uh, with Ridge Avenue being the width that it is, in order to have two four-foot bike lanes, it would be necessary to eliminate parking on one side of the street. Uh, otherwise, we're saying if a car is parked across an actual bike lane, then the bicyclists will have to go out around the parked car, which kind of uh, compromises that safety when we're talking about uh, riding when you're uh, when the sun is rising um, so they also recognize that eliminating parking is a concern and they're proposing a community meeting um, in the community room of the library on March 29th um, they would like the city to send letters to property owners with frontage on Ridge Avenue inviting them to provide feedback and input after gathering the feedback they would decide whether to bring forward a recommendation to the council. And uh, if the council likes this method of engagement, the Safe Routes would use this as a similar model for other streets. Uh, the idea being that if the affected owners agree or have no strong objections to eliminating the parking, then, then the Safe Routes committee would uh, ask the council to approve an ordinance to eliminate parking on, on one side of Ridge Avenue. Uh, I was hoping that somebody from the Safe Routes Committee would be here to, to uh, talk and answer questions, but uh, they weren't able to at this point. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to get your feelings on this. It's not up for a, for a vote per se. It's more um, to inform you and to get a consensus as to whether or not you think this is a good idea for for them to c proceed with going to a community meeting to discuss this. I just have one comment for you, Howard. I've lived one house off of Ridge Avenue for about 35 years. I travel that extensively, and if I see four kids riding a bike during the morning going to school up there, that's that's an excessive amount. So you can take that for what it's worth. So I will just counter that I ride my bike on there, not right now, but I have with my son many times, and I know a lot of people do. So the numbers, you know, we could do a count if you need that, but that's anecdotal. And so that's why it came up is that Ridge Street is a pretty heavily biked and pedestrian used street in the community. One other thing about Ridge Avenue, if you sh make it smaller, that's a cut across for every farm piece of uh, machinery and large trucks. So you're going to have a real issue with that during spring, summer, fall. Just so you're aware of that because you know how that road's traveled understood the argument from the community safe routes committee which i'm on would be that that's even more of a reason to put in bike lanes so that we have a safety area that's well marked so drivers see that they should be expecting bikes on that road well i guess if you have you know 50 70 kids every morning that definitely would be necessary the idea is to make it safer so kids feel more comfortable doing it so that they can do it too usually when you build infrastructure where people feel comfortable using it. This would not only be for kids, this would also be for a number of bike riders that are, um, let's say, above the age of 18. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of those people that don't work probably ride it in the morning, but most of those people work, don't they? Uh, I think there's a lot of people that ride the bikes and there's more coming into the community. so. Personally, I think it's probably a good recommendation to take a look at. Well, they're asking for a meeting on March 29th, and the council can decide at our first meeting in March whether or not to um, go along with that idea because they would like the city to send the letters, so we would have to give the okay to do that. I have a question for Howard. Uh, 
did the committee decide on which uh, side of the street to uh, park off, north, south? If it's north, I would, uh, seems to me, favor uh, safety as far as morning sun. What we're looking at is is which which parking lane would be uh, recommended for for removal. That's what I'm uh, asking. They did not specify one at the present time. You know, we would be looking at that, and we would be looking at community input as well. Um, you know, there there are many different uh, considerations. You know. Most of those houses up there have have driveways and they park in their driveways. There are some people who who park on the street. Um, you know, we have Smith Park that's on the south side, and sometimes people uh, want to use the uh, the wood shelter for parties and things like that. And sometimes you have uh, people who want to park on that side of the street for, for parties and other things. So do you eliminate parking on on the north side instead? Uh, we haven't really made a determination. That's why they're looking at getting feedback from the people who live up there. So if I, if I could interject, I think the question here tonight is whether or not you like this model of engagement. So do you like the idea of the Safe Routes to School Committee organizing a community meeting to get feedback before bringing the item forward, before us bringing the item forward to you? Or would you like to propose a different model of engagement or a different way of approaching uh, these types of issues? I personally like this model. I do too. I'll say one thing, Howard, though, the, our narrowing of the roadway down there by between the pool and Smith Park going to come back and bite us now because right now if you park a vehicle on each side of that street you can't get two cars through there and I mentioned that to you before now if we need to now we need that area if to make a safe area for the, for the kids getting in the pool and stuff now we're going to even be tighter and it's unfortunate because we do need a safe area up there for kids going to the pool it's too bad we narrowed that I don't think it would narrow it because they're proposing removing no, no, I mean, one it's already been narrowed from construction? Yeah, yeah oh. when they changed that okay. road. No, 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 no. I think it's very important to have safe right up there for the kids. But it's, if we hadn't have narrowed it already okay. with the previous construction, what you're we would, about. we'd be able to do it easier. All right. We'll have a discussion on this next time. Uh, well, we were hoping not to bring it back, but just to get bring some direction. Back. Just to okay the idea of the. Are you comfortable with the direction? Yeah, I'm comfortable. I am too. Um, <laughs> this will only be for looking at Ridge Avenue. At this point in time, yes. Yes. If the model were successful, then uh, <coughs> rather than us coming to the council each time, we would they would probably just use the model for future streets before bringing the recommendation forward. I would think that they would bring it to the council each time, just so you have a, an overview to look at it if they want to do that. I don't see if this goes through and this works, that's fine. But I don't think a carte blanche should be. A committee could go along to every street and say, well, this is what we're going to do, and you do it. I think it's necessary to have the council discussion on, on whatever street you do. And just to be clear, that the it would be for the community engagement process, um, but the recommendation would always come forward to the council. So if this was the community engagement process for Ridge, they might use a similar community meeting with, uh, with uh, Southwest Road and use that feedback and then bring a proposal forward to the council as based as on the feedback. to the council each and every time, that's fine. That's demanding. Sounds like we're all right with using it for at least Ridge Avenue. The only question I have are the, the walkers, people who walk that street. Yes. Has that been reviewed? Did I walk that street all the time? They just walk the lane, the bike lane? Okay, thank you. All right, that ends, unless anybody else has anything else, that ends the uh, televised portion of our meeting because we are going into a work session. So we can take a three-minute break. Three. Maybe five. Three. <laughs> <laughs>